Turn with me to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Very familiar scripture. Our title today is The Incomparable Christ. Our scripture begins in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have your uh, bulletin, you'll find the outline of today's Bible study. I'd like to read uh, the first paragraph. It's an uh, encounter a pastor had on an airplane. It said he, returning from a conference by plane, I found myself seated next to a young man who was a television director from Boston. As time went on, our conversation turned to the subject of religion. He mentioned the fact that he believed himself to be a Christian, that he believed in Jesus Christ. And then he said, however, of course, that does not mean that I do not also believe in of other religions are good and valid, and that all the other founders of these religions are also great men. Of course, I do not go along with the idea that Jesus is the only way. Now, I want to preach this message today for two purposes. One, for someone that might be here that is not a Christian, that you might know the way to God, and that you might know that way is Jesus Christ alone. And having known that, you might put your faith in Christ and be saved and have the gift of eternal life, that you come to know God as your Father and Jesus as your Savior. And the other purpose is for all of you who are believers to encourage your confidence in Christ that you are convinced totally that Jesus is the only way to God. And being convinced, you might be motivated, you might be bold to share with your friends, neighbors, and loved ones how they might find their way to God through Christ. We have to be absolutely sure of what we're talking about if we're going to say anything or else we'll just be quiet. I want to encourage your confidence today in the incomparable Christ. He and he alone is the only way to God. Amen. Now, there are three reasons in this scripture that I want to lift up uh, to prove that fact. And the first reason is simply this. If there is one way to God, and Jesus is the way, then that way must be innately understood. <coughs> now, what I mean by that, if God is God and there is only one, and he's created all things and he's created us, surely the way to know him as God, the way to relate to him as God, have a relationship with him as God, he has made that way known to us innately. Innately. Within us. That there's something in us that resonates in spirit and in mind and, and conscience. That when we see that way, it is the way. God has equipped us that way. It's interesting how this uh, uh, few verses start. It ends uh, chapter 13 where Jesus is going to the cross. And he begins to tell his disciples where he's going. He talks about Father's house. And then he says something very interesting in verse 4. Where I go, you know. And the way, you know. This is something Jesus understood his disciples to know. The place he was going, and the way he was going. And I don't know if you've ever been in a, a situation under a teacher. A teacher expounds something and expects you to know it, and you don't know it, 
and you sit there stupid and dumb and you ain't going to let people know how dumb you are, you keep your mouth shut. Thomas is not like that. Thomas just blurts out. He don't care if, if it's a dumb question. He's just going to ask it. He said, Jesus, we do not know where you're going, and I sure don't know the way. It's sort of like this under Bible study note A. Alexander McLaren said it's like a humorous disagreement. Jesus said, you know where I'm going? You know the way. Thomas said, I don't know where you're going. I don't know the way. Jesus said, you know where I'm going? You know the way. It's sort of like an argument my wife and I had and I got lost in Knoxville, Tennessee. She said, you know where you're going? I said, no, I don't. She said, you know where you're going? I said, I don't. Jesus and Thomas had this going on. Jesus said, you know where I'm going? You know the way? Thomas said, no, no, no. I don't know where you're going. I don't know the way. Who was right? They both were right. You see, Thomas knew, but he didn't know he knew. He knew it innately. Under Bible study note B, we know more than we realize. When it comes to knowing things, we know more than we realize. For example, here's a young man, and he says to his father, I have a girlfriend, but how am I going to know when I fall in love, Dad? And his dad very wisely says, you'll know. You'll know. Did you know? You did Here's a lady who's having her first child. And she says to her mom, how will I know how to be a mother? And her mother says, you'll know. You'll know. There's just some things we come equipped to know. Turn with me to Micah. Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6 and verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord? In other words, what does the Lord require of me? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn? What does God want? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Notice what verse 8 says. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. He has shown you. He has revealed to you what's required. And this is what you know. You may not say you know it, but you know it. This is what God requires of you, to be just, to do justly, to be merciful, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God. We know that. When we read that, there's something inside of us that says, I know that. Just like when you look at Jesus, you hear about Jesus, something down here says, I know that. I agree. He is the way. It's something God put in us that we would know him. You see, we know more than we realize. And we know more than we care to admit under C. We know more than we care to admit. You may be here this morning and say, I don't know the way to God. Maybe you just know more than you care to admit. When I was growing up on the farm, I found a way to get out of a lot of chores. When Dad said, do you know how to climb up in the silo and throw out the silage to feed the, the cows? I said, no, I don't know how to do that. What, well, do you know how to do this? No, I don't know how to do that either. We know more than we care to admit. Turn with me to Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. A very interesting scripture. It says in verse 19, Because that may be known of God is manifest in them. Who is the pronoun them referring to? All people. People who say they know and people who, don't, who say they don't know. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen. The heavens declare his glory. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, the pronoun they, refers to all of us. They, 
are without excuse. We know more than we care to admit. You see, if there is only one way to God, and that way to God is Jesus, it must be innately understandable. There must be some equipment that I come with when I was born that I would affirm who God is because he's my creator and the way to him must be known inside of me. And surely it is. Years ago in my first church, I had a lady come by the name of Sharon Hall. And Sharon came forward on a Sunday morning and she said, I want to... I want to be a part of this church. I want to be baptized. I said, Sharon, have you got saved? Yes. I said, where? She said, on my own, out in the woods. She'd never been to church in her life. As far as I know, she didn't have a Bible, hadn't heard the gospel preach, and yet she had received Christ, and she came into our church. We baptized her. She became the most faithful member that we could have. Some months later, another man by the name of Mike Jude came forward with the same experience. I was beginning to wonder, do I even need to preach? There is something that comes within us when we're born. Some uh, ordinary operating equipment that recognize who God is. And if Jesus is the only way, you can know that. You are equipped to know that unless you just don't want to admit it and excuse yourself. But there is no excuse. Amen? Give him praise for being the way. Now, if, Jesus, if there is one way to God and Jesus is that way, another reason that he is the only way, or another way that we can prove that, is that the way must be logically verifiable. Logically verifiable. I mean, if God made us, and he did, and if he gave us a mind to think and to deduce and to apply logic, would he, find a, would he give us a way to know him that would be illogical or irrational? Absolutely not. It must be logically verifiable. Now, under Bible study note A, under Bible study note A, Jesus is the way to God. While other religious, religious leaders point to a set of rules and say, follow that, or a creed and say, follow that, or a code of conduct and say, follow that. Jesus pointed to himself and said, follow me. You see, uh, he is the way. He is the way. He never pointed away from himself to anything else. He always pointed to himself. Sharon and I was on vacation in Florida and going through Orlando and we got lost. I do this a lot. <laughs> but now I've got my GPS, I find, you know, it's so easy to find my way around, but didn't have GPS then and I stopped at a service station and asked the way. And the guy said, this way, that way. And I said, that's very complicated. I'll never remember it. He said, forget it. He said, follow me. I got back in the car. My wife said, how do we go? I said, I don't know. She said, what did he say? He said, follow me. We're following him. He's the way. Jesus is the way. Amen. And here's the way you read this title. The title is like this, I am the way, the way is the title, and the truth and the life are the explanatory notes. In other words, read it like this, Jesus is the way because he's the truth, and Jesus is the way because he's the life. Now, this must, this must have verification. Logically, I must be able to verify this. How can I know he's the truth? Everybody's saying, they're the truth. This is the way. This is the real way. Some time ago on Oprah Winfrey, when she was just an ordinary person, now she's run for president. Um, but then she was a resident theologian. 
Uh, she, uh, she had uh, Shirley MacLaine on her show, and, and Shirley MacLaine had just had this new revelation, spiritual revelation. And uh, so Oprah asked her, said, Shirley, how do you find God? She said, Oprah, it's like this. We have five sources of energy in our body. Five. They are called chakrams. And if you line them up in your body, you'll find God. Now, how do you line them up, Oprah said? By meditation, Shirley said. By meditating, you can line up these five sources of energy in your body, and you'll find God. And then Oprah, in her nice little way, which I appreciate sometimes, she said, Shirley, how you know that? How you know that? And Shirley McLean said, because of the sages in the East, those old wise men from Eastern religions, that's how I found it out. Well, friends, if the way to God is Jesus, how do we know it's the way? How we know it's really the way? Under Bible study note B, Jesus is the way because he's the truth. He claimed to be God in the flesh, and the resurrection proved him to be right. You see, we don't believe he's the way because he said it. We believe he's the way because he said, if you destroy this body in three days, it'll be resurrected. On the third day, he came back from the grave, and today the grave is empty. That's how we know he's the truth. He told the truth. The empty grave vindicates what he said. He is the way because he's the truth. And there's not a fact in history that's been more scrutinized than the resurrection. And there's not an event in history that's been more proven legally, scientifically, and theologically more than the resurrection. Jesus is the way because he's the truth. He rose from the dead just as he said he would, he did it. And just as he said he would, he did it. Just as who he said he was, he is. Not only that, but Jesus is the way because he's the life. Because he's the life. Uh, when you think about the way to God, the way to God must be holiness, righteousness. You know how I know that? Because innately I know that. The way to God is not immorality. I know that. I don't even have to read the Bible to know that, do you? The way to God is holiness. The way to God is love. It's not hate. It's not violence. It's peace. The way to God is joy. Not depression. The way to God is forgiveness. And Jesus taught us, if someone takes your coat, give him your overcoat too. If someone hits you on one side of the face, turn your other side. If someone despises you, love them and pray for them. What are we saying? This is the way to God. But guess what? It's an impossible way. You can't do that. You can't love those who hate you. You can't turn the other cheek to those that hit you. Unless you have a supernatural life within you. Under Bible study note C, Jesus is the way because he's the truth. He's also the way because he is the life. We're talking about a living way. We're talking about an supernatural living way. And you can't live this way, you can't act this way, you can't do these things without the very life of Jesus coming inside of you. Gypsy Smith one time said, any old dead fish can swim downstream. But to go that way, to go God's way, to go Jesus' way, you have to have life. And he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. You got to have his life. And you can verify the fact he's the way if his life comes within you 
and empowers you to live a victorious life over hate and over resentment and over hostility. You know that you've found the way. You verify it by the very life you live. You want to know how Jesus, how we know Jesus is the life and he's the way? It's because you look at his followers. They live different than everybody else. Amen. Give him praise. This is verifiable. Now, and thirdly, thirdly, the way to God is universally accessible. Jesus said, I am the way. There is no other way to God except through me. It is universally accessible. Some teach under Bible study note A that Muslims are saved through Muhammad and Buddhists are saved through Buddha, and Christians are saved through Jesus. This is not so. This is not so. This is a heresy. Under Acts 4.12, nor is there any other salvation, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Now someone might say, well, what about people who lived before Jesus? No one ever did. Jesus said, before Abraham, I was. And Paul talked about Moses walking through the wilderness and taking the children of Israel through the wilderness. And he talked about the water that came from the rock and that rock followed them. And you know what he said then? He said, that rock is Christ. Christ did not... Uh, just uh, begin his life in Bethlehem. He is the eternal Christ. He always has been. He always is. He always will be. He is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And guess what? Whosoever calleth on that name shall be saved. It is accessible to everyone at any time in any country. Someone said, what about those people that never heard about Christ? C.H. Spurgeon said it like this. Why do you, a better thing to ask is not what about those people who never heard about Christ. A better question is, what about us who've heard about Christ and we don't share Christ? Can we be saved? That is a much bigger question. Is it not? Is it not? There are millions of people being saved in Africa China, throughout the world. There's more people being saved in these third world countries than they are in America anymore. We need to be sure who Christ is so that we share him with our friends, our neighbors, and our co-workers. Under Bible study note B, some think that we are saved by faith. Faith that's authentic. Faith that's sincere in purpose and in confidence. I think not. We're not saved by faith, in faith. Faith never saved anybody. Faith alone will not save you. It's faith alone in Christ alone that saves. You can have faith and be drowning. Have faith that a life jacket will save you but it will not save you unless you have the life jacket. You can have faith, and you can be sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Your faith has to connect you to the Savior, and Jesus is a Savior. Paul and Silas was in prison, and they had an earthquake, and prison was broke loose, and Paul and Silas were set free. And the Philippian jailer came running, crying, ready to commit suicide. Paul said, do yourself no harm. And the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31 said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe. Not just believe, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's universally accessible. Anybody, anywhere can receive Christ as their personal Savior. Now, follow me here. 
Because from here, I want to make the point very clear that Jesus is the only way, and he's universally accessible, and he's uh, logically verifiable, and he's uh, uh, innately understandable. Under Bible study note C, if the way is imposed upon life, whatever way it is, if it's imposed upon life, it's a way. There may be many ways. If the way is imposed upon life, it's a way. But if it's the revelation of life, of life itself, it's the way. Notice the difference between a way and the way. If it's the revelation of life, it's the way. If the way is only written in Scripture, it's a way. The Scripture alone does not make it the way. If it's written in Scripture alone, it's a way. But if it's written in Scripture and written in the very reality of life, then it's the way. I hope you see the difference. If it's written in Scripture alone, it's a way. But if it's written in Scripture and written in the very reality of life, it's the way. I want you to turn Colossians with me. I don't think I got the scripture for you, so you're going to have to work a little harder. Colossians chapter 1. And I'm closing here, so it'll make you a little more eager to find it. This is where I jump on a chair. Verse 15. This is Jesus. Remember, if he's written, if the way is written in the Bible alone, it's a way. But if it's written in the Bible and the reality of life, it's the way. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, Jesus. The firstborn over all creation. For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. I guess I did have it for you. All things are created through him. Everything is created through him and for him. So therefore... Write this down. He is the way life was built. Everything was created through him and for him. He is the way life was built. His way is written into every nerve, every tissue, every atom, every molecule. His way is written into every cell in your body because you're created through him and for him. His way is the way life was built. His way is written into every tissue and cell of your body. He is the way life was built, and he is the only way life will work. He's the only way life will work. Thomas Edison, one of the greatest inventors of all time, probably invented more things than anyone else. One time was working on an invention, and, he, and his assistant wanted him to give up on it because he tried and tried and tried. It didn't work. His assistant just exasperated and said, Mr. Edison, we tried 1,100 ways to get this to work. It will not work. Thomas Edison's reply was, we've tried 1,100 ways that it won't work. We're going to find the one way it will work. Now look at me. Some of you here have tried 1,100 ways to get your life to work. 11,000 ways. 11 million ways. And it just will not work. There is a way it will work. Amen. There's a way it will work. Jesus is the way. I got to pray with someone yesterday. I, 
I prayed God would lay some soul on my heart so I could put it in my card. The five names I'm praying for, I got to pray with a man who is on heroin. And I know heroin is a horrible, horrible enemy and a terrible uh, uh, form of slavery. But I had to tell him, and I really believe it, there's a power greater than heroin at work in this world. And there's a way that your life will work. There's a way your life will work. And Jesus is the way. AA was started years ago by two men, an Episcopalian priest and a man by the name of Bill who is anonymous. Bill was a drunkard. His wife told him, one more time and I'm gone. He went to work drunk. He got fired. He went home. She was gone. He decided to commit suicide. And while he was pondering how he was going to end his life, he looked at his watch, and he noticed his watch was not working. And uh, he had a very expensive watch, a very sophisticated, complex watch that told you everything, including the weather. And he, it just took his mind off of suicide for a minute, and he wanted to get it fixed before he ended his life. And he went to the juror. And when he went in, the juror told him, said, listen, this watch is too much for me. I can't work on it. I can't help you with it. It's so sophisticated, you got to take it back to the manufacturer. He's the only one can fix it, the one that made it. He left that juror shop, walking down the street, and it dawned on him like that. The one that made me is the one that can fix me. Jesus is the way life was built, and he's the only way life will work. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we just thank you today for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you declared that you're the way, the truth, and the life, and we believe it. We believe it innately. We believe it because we verify it, and we believe it because you are accessible to us and when we called on you, you came into our hearts. Now, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that he will fix whatever is broken in your life. He will forgive your sins. He will give you a new life. He will bring you to the Father and give you eternal life. You come this morning. You come this morning. We want to pray for you this morning. We want to share with you the Word of God, how you can know for sure if you die, you go to heaven. And if you're already a Christian, and most of us are. I want you to be so sure that Jesus is the only way that you will run out of this room today and you'll share that with someone else. Oh, God wants you not to be silent. He wants you to share. And I've been praying every day, God lay some soul in my heart, and this week he put one right in my lap. I expect him to give me four more. I want you to come and pray for someone, maybe a member of your family, Maybe a son or daughter, aunt or uncle, brother, or sister. Maybe a neighbor. Someone that's in danger of dying without God. Would you come and ask God to do something for them? You come and pray as we close the service in Jesus' name.